So we'll um, start the symposium. Uh, first of all, my name is Gary Aslanian. I work uh, in Geneva at the uh, World Health Organization Special Program TDR. It's called special not because we're special, although we feel we are, but it's special because we're not only uh, sponsored by the WHO, we're also sponsored by UNICEF, UNDP, and World Bank. And we're only one of two research programs. So if you can imagine, the WHO is more of a public health agency at a global level, and research is uh, only one component what the organization does. So the symposium, I'm pleased to see uh, being a collaborative uh, work at the uh, sidelines of the uh, Armenian Medical International Medical Congress, which I think is going to be opened tonight, uh, and it's one or two days. So probably many of you are going to go there. Um, but it's also in collaboration with AUA, School of Public Health, and, and ourselves um, at, at, at TDR. Um, the purpose of this, and, and obviously I've been given this task to chair the symposium, but um, a lot of other people have done 99.9% .9 of work, is to introduce the uh, operational research, training for operational research and in implementation research, um, and using one way that we have been doing um, at uh, WHO as well as with some other partners called SORTED and you'll hear a little bit uh, later about that. Obviously, we're going to hear about um, the uh, training done here at AUA at master's level that includes some of this as well, um, and, and later two presentations from two uh, uh, international journals. And, and the purpose is to use the research and, and training to um, use research to um, eventually have health impact and use the data that is available uh, and increasingly many of you probably know uh, data available is going to change a lot of things uh, at, at the global level but we hope that that will also have an impact on health and, and, and health of populations so over the course of symposium you will uh, learn how to make uh, countries uh, more uh, information and evidence rich to make decisions and, and how best to present that information to global and local audiences. Um, probably without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Vartui Petrosyan. She is professor here at AUA and dean of the School of uh, Public Health, as well as the director of uh, Health uh, Research um, Center. Um, um, do not repeat this, but I used to work there um, when I was young and stupid, but uh, both to be challenged. Um, Bartui, um, is um, her research is focusing on um, health services, as well as she teaches a wide range of courses here at AUA. She's also an associate editor uh, with the Journal of Equity in Health, from whom you will hear later on. So perhaps uh, we'll invite Vartuhi over here. Hello, everyone. It's a special pleasure to host this event today uh, because I see many familiar faces, including the chair of the symposium, Gary Aslanian. Dr. Aslanian has been one of our earlier graduates, actually the graduate from the first cohort, and one of his professors, Kim Hakimian, is with us today, so it was a lovely meeting between uh, them. So thank you, Gary, for agreeing to chair this meeting today. Why have we decided to co-host this event? Uh, because we see the value of the program. Uh, it's in line with the mission of the Terpanjan School of Public Health uh, that prepares health professionals uh, that become later leaders among other things in health services research and evaluation. And actually, uh, many of the facilitators involved in the program are also our graduates. So I looked at the uh, posters, 
that are uh, presented on the hallways. And in the overwhelming majority, I have seen the names of Master of Public Health graduates from AUA. That's really rewarding to see like how they take leadership and help many other health professionals to do what they are supposed to do and to share the uh, learned experiences with mainly decision makers. Uh, this is the core for evidence-based policy making and we have tried to build capacity and I can see not only in Armenia but in the region, I see many international colleagues today who are here thanks to the Sorted uh, program. So welcome, uh, and I want also to add that many of our graduates um, uh, do research, they collect data, analyze and write reports that are later shared with decision makers, but also with the international community of scholars. We publish in international peer-reviewed journals, and I'm very proud uh, to share that information uh, with you today. Um, one more thing, why uh, I think uh, our graduates are involved so heavily in this program? Uh, because, you know, the program uh, during the second year, it heavily focuses on evidence-based public health practice that gives uh, this kind of skills. So you're welcome. I'm very happy that the School of Public Health is co-hosting this event. Uh, I wish good luck to every presenter today you know that there will be an award at the end of the event. And I'm very happy that we have very well-known editors-in-chief from two very interesting international peer-reviewed journals. Thank you. It's probably going to be the exercise I need today, the going back and forth. Uh, so uh, thanks for um, the welcome, uh, Vartui. Our next speaker will dive into more details of Sorted for you to all understand and appreciate the process and how it's done. And Karapet Davtian is uh, probably one of the Sorted stars. And, and I'm not sure if there's a hall of uh, stars, a hall of uh, fame of stars, but if there was one, he probably would be there. Uh, he is currently working here in, in Armenia. He works for the FMD KL Europe, uh, which is um, um, a semi-private or private um, company that uh, um, he works with, but also been working with TB uh, for many years in research and operational implementation research in Armenia and in the region. Um, and, and you will also see that later uh, at the posters. So um, um, he's also an alumni of AUA and also alumni of Sorted. Um, that's uh, probably not super comparable, but uh, it's a, it's a, um, uh, something that uh, the um, sorted alumni have in common. Uh, so perhaps I'll just invite you to come over, Caro. So thank you very much for the introduction. It's very it's honor for me to be here as a AVA graduate again and. Uh, within the next 15 minutes, I'll present about sort it a little bit more in details. This is combination of the presentation uh, of uh, Dr. Roni and uh, Tony, uh, which they are presenting uh, in international uh, conferences within maybe one and a half hour, but I will do it within 15 minutes, so I'll provide high-level information. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I can answer it. Uh, after the presentation. So in general, what is operation, operational research? Uh, it defines as in healthcare, what is operational research in he healthcare is uh, defined as a search for knowledge on interventions, strategies, or tools that can enhance the performance of healthcare services. But usually when people are asking us what is operational research, I'm saying if it's not experimental study, it's operational research. So what is SORTED doing? Uh, SORTED is Structured Operational Research and Training Initiative. Uh, it is an uh, uh, operational research training course, actually, and a global partnership, which is coordinated by TDR. 
and implemented, implemented by different partners. Uh, Sorted is uh, supporting uh, to conduct operational research uh, around the, uh, for uh, different countries or institutions around their own priorities uh, to make evidence-based decision making. It tar uh, targets implementers, so mainly sorted participants are people who are working in healthcare programs. And the approach is uh, doing, so, uh, doing, during the course, uh, participants are doing operational research. So it's a learning while doing approach. Uh, during the course, there are milestone sub objectives which participants need to meet in order to pass the uh, next step. And sorted publications, uh, sorted studies are submitted in different international journals, mainly in open access publications, uh, op open, uh, published in open access uh, format. So why sorted is important? Uh, this slide illustrates one of the main reasons why, why this operational research and sorted is important. Uh, mainly to build trust between decision makers and researchers because always there is a gap between researchers and decision makers. Here, uh, this slide uh, in this illustration, uh, the people in the balloon is coming and saying, where, where uh, am I? And the people here is saying, you are 30 meters above the ground in a balloon. He's asking, you must be a researcher Yes, how did you know? And because, that, uh, because what you told me is absolutely correct, but completely useless. And he's saying, you must be a, a policy maker. Yes, how did you know? Because you don't know where you are uh, now, uh, you don't know where you are going, and now you are blaming me. So this gap exists between decision makers and uh, researchers. And sorted is created the way that uh, helps to fill this gap. Another reason why sorted is important because uh, this uh, course showed efficiency in publishing and sharing the information. Uh, for example, previously, the, those who implemented the sorted actually they had another experience during 2001, 2007. They conducted another operational research. Uh, 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 programs uh, traditional in traditional way teaching and uh, allowing uh, leaving the research uh, to conduct the research uh, those who can, uh, pass the courses and out of 62 participants only 28 participants developed operational research uh, protocols eventually no one was published actually so efficiency was very low and uh, there are many studies uh, showing that on average, this kind of courses have 20 to 30 percent publication rate, while sorted uh, during uh, uh, out of 60 so, uh, completed sorted courses, which were completed bef before March 2019, uh, there was 640 studies conducted, and 400 uh, already 76 percent were published, and many of the studies are uh, still in uh, submission and publication process. Another reason is that sorted, shows, uh, sorted publications are very cost effective. On average, uh, the cost of one publication is about 7,000 euro. This is not including the time of the facilitators' instructions. Sometimes this is in-kind contribution also. And another extreme is that similar publication which Sorted is doing in 7,000 euro is uh, EU-funded studies, which is costing about 20,000, 24,000 euro. So you see this kind of, again, extremes exist. But uh, importantly, sorted also supporting the sorted projects when published to, to be implemented uh, and influencing on uh, decision making and improving the public health. Because sorted participants, as I told already, uh, our uh, program uh, mainly uh, those who are part, uh, in working in public health programs, and so research questions are focused on uh, routine data. And this uh, uh, Ministry of Fiji, uh, to, uh, as they told, 
our country is data rich, meaning this kind of data. Probably our country is data rich, but information poor, and sorted is uh, uh, making countries data rich, information rich, and action rich. And how is it uh, working? What are the enabling factors? Uh, sorted has modular approach. There are three modules during the uh, actual uh, research period during the course. There's a module four, which is about implementation, uh, about sh uh, showing the results of, their, uh, of the publications. But main three modules, uh, first one is protocol development. Th uh, second module is about quality of the data and statistical analysis. And third module is manuscript writing. This each module is about uh, six or seven days. Uh, there are lectures and discussions during the course. Uh, two facilitators are supporting two participants. And there are groups during the course who are working together. Uh, there are plenary presentations, milestones, as I told, also during the course, participants step by step doing their uh, research and presenting during the course. And it's uh, overall, it's hands on mentorship from module one to paper in press. And it shifts the paradigm of uh, research because it's, it brings also collaboration between uh, different healthcare programs. But the main thing is that those who, who are implementers, they are conduct, they, they, this is co ownership of all participants, but main uh, studies conducted by those who are implementing this example is Malawi example when NTP has to conduct the study, but all participants, international and local, are supporting to formulate the research ideas and TB program uh, management receives uh, and feels the ownership of the uh, result of the study and it supports the influence on the programs. So it is also all about collaboration and networking also. Thank you very much. I think Any there questions? is, yeah, there are two microphones on each side. If you'd like to uh, pose a question. Thank you, Caro, for an uh, interesting and short presentation. My question is the following, about the quality of data. I know you're working with countries with data sets that already exist. How do you make sure that there is decent quality so that the published information is really valuable. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Very important, actually, question and problem we are encountering during the course. Sometimes, really, uh, participants are coming for manuscript development module with very poor quality of data. But uh, the idea is if they are in uh, program, uh, working in their program, and really there exists some problem they feel they exist. We are trying to find, to support, to find some uh, analysis uh, to make the paper. But, but if the quality of the data is really poor, then we cannot do anything. That's why the publication rate is not like 100%. But in these situations, we are trying to support participants to write maybe a uh, letter to editors, not original research, but letter to editors or uh, other kind of short researches, I don't know. Okay, I can add one more um, interesting byproduct of sort. It has been, and again, I'm, it is not my day job. I, my colleagues work, uh, work on this. But what happens sometimes is also when they realize the quality of data is poor or there are a lot of major gaps or they are not really measuring where, what they're supposed to measure, uh, these people have gone back to their jobs because all of them work in, in the system, in the health system, in the public health system, and they have actually addressed or they have brought this up and really realized through this experience until they started using their own data, they had no idea that how bad it is or uh, what kind of gaps they have. And that was yeah. really the additional unexpected uh, outcome of this approach. Uh, it was basically a feedback to data from a first-hand um, person who actually is in charge of data sometimes. And they go back and they actually address yeah. this. Thank you very much for this addition. In fact, uh, there are a lot of sorted publications which are showing that there is something wrong in this program because data showing something wrong. 
So in one of the best uh, examples, short publication in, uh, we are presenting during the course is similar publication which shows that the data in the program is completely uh, not making sense. And this leads to make changes in the program and improve the data. Okay, we ha I think we have time for one more question if people have any, any comments. No? You can do that if, in... If there is time, yeah. just shortly I would like to say that Sorted is also very flexible. Uh, it's now uh, implemented in different geographic areas and different healthcare programs. And uh, also it's innovative for, and uh, particularly we did sort it in Armenia last year and uh, for the first two, two modules uh, we did, uh, we used electronic sorted uh, materials, they are pub publicly available in YouTube, le these lectures, and uh, by so we reduced the sorted cost uh, by 70%, like first two modules was almost free. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think my insecurities or worries of time have disappeared. I was worried we're going to be behind the time. Our next two speakers are going to uh, focus on, 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 on examples of publishing. And we have two editors-in-chief from two uh, journals. First one is the uh, International Journal for Equity in Health, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Ifrat Shadmi. Uh, she obviously has a day job, I'm sure, uh, which is uh, she's working at the School of Nursing at the University of Haifa, which is just north of Tel Aviv. And she's also a Fulbright uh, grantee and, and a registered uh, nurse, obviously, in, in, in Israel. In uh, some other things that she's done in terms of um, closer to policy, she's been advising um, one of the major nonprofit healthcare organizations in Israel. But today, obviously, she'll talk about the the journal and 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 its um, and its uh, expectations and impact. Please. So thank you. It is a real uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to meet the wonderful work that you're doing here. I was happy to see some of it uh, shortly before we started, but I'm um, looking forward to seeing more of your projects at the second part of this day. Um, I would like to show you uh, where I'm from. It's uh, quite near, two and a half uh, hour flight. It's not through uh, Syria, of course, like Google and <laughs> Drew here, but really a short flight, so you're all welcome uh, to Israel. My city is Haifa, at the north part of Israel by the Mediterranean Sea, so you see I have a wonderful uh, view of the Haifa Bay, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, largest civilian ports in Israel, and my university is on the Carmel Mountain, and my window is right here, so you can see why it's very hard to work. Uh, distracting the view. What I would like to talk about is a little bit about research ideas and uh, where they stem from and how they lead us to publish. I want to ask the question and try to answer it, why publish? So I try to challenge a bit uh, how we go about publishing, where to publish, and of course present the International Journal for Equity and Health. So where do research ideas stem from? Uh, some ideas come to us just out of our thoughts, our experience, our passion, uh, our uh, involvement in uh, various aspects of our lives. As healthcare professionals and public health workers, uh, we often encounter issues related to the health of the population or healthcare uh, gaps that uh, bring to our attention the need to investigate more or to f try to find out how to do better, how to improve. And research ideas uh, often also come from the literature. So we look at what is already known in the topic of our interest, and then how can we uh, uh, add to this what is not known and therefore uh, is worthy of investigation. 
But really all of these come together because they all play part in how we go about finding a research topic of uh, interest and of importance and which is relevant to the literature. And the issue of, uh, uh, it's of my interest and many in this audience, of course, is the issue, issues related to health equity. And when we look at um, health equity, it really has to do with every aspect of health and health care. Poverty, race, ageism, violence, the environment, gay and lesbian rights or other marginalized populations. And if we look at the contents, it's really based on what uh, Margaret Whitehead has uh, given to us in terms of conceptualization is the social determinants of health, how they interact, how they affect the individual level. And if we notice the role of healthcare, try to use this, it is only a small part of this big rainbow of determinants, but it has an important role on how these social determinants really are manifested and affected and how we treat them and possibly uh, reduce them when we talk about the tools available in the healthcare system. One of the most uh, influential uh, uh, experts in the field that you're probably all well, well, uh, well acknowledge his work is Sir Michael Marmot, which has uh, about 10 years ago was set out to uh, really introduce the, um, what is required for reducing health inequities which uh, one of the important aspects is to give every child the best start in life, enable all children, young people, and adults to maintain their capabilities. And Sir Marmar talked about the role of communities and of policy. And in this uh, short video, he presents what has happened almost 10 years since the first Marmot review and what we should think about in terms of health equity in this uh, upcoming 10-year anniversary of the report. The Marmot Review was a review of health inequalities in England. Last year, we pointed out that life expectancy had stopped increasing, something that had gone on for more than 90 years, an increase of about one year every four years, in 2011 slowed down nearly to a halt. Life expectancy as a measure of health tells us a great deal about how we're doing as a society and the inequalities in health tell us even more about society. So if life expectancy has stopped improving and inequalities are widening, it's really urgent to ask what's going on, what's going wrong and what can we do about it. We plan to publish our second review exactly on the 10-year anniversary of the publication of the Marmot Review. What we're aiming for in this work is for governments to take more notice. We know that healthcare probably has um, far less um, influence over people's health than other factors such as uh, your early life experience, such as whether you have a good job, um, whether you're living in a crime-free neighbourhood, whether you've got good housing, whether you're educated well, and whether you have a viable and supportive local community. And all those things, or a lot of them, are very much affected by the uh, policies uh, by government and also the actions of wider actors other than the communities themselves. Doing it with the Health Foundation, which is a very important player in the health system, in the UK means we've got an important partner. It enables us to do it in a more in-depth way than we could otherwise. This work is very, very important. Uh, it's a major feature of our work at the Health Foundation and it's particularly pertinent because we see the health improvements that we've taken for granted over the last few decades stall and we want to get under the skin about why that's the case and work out what policies are now needed to remedy them. Okay, so uh, of course this is a broad overview and others are also presenting and discussing when we try to look at the sources. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a little bit background music. Other 
excellent sources for us to turn to are uh, reports from a, a world organization such as the WHO uh, delineating what are the courses of action. Uh, this has to do with the way we frame our research and the way we think about the audience, potential audience, where we want to reach. The, um, I guess fortunately for uh, us looking to um, find ways to influence in our field, but unfortunate for the health equity field itself, as stated in the video, there are many aspects and uh, each one of us can look into their own field, whether it's nursing or environmental health or any aspect of medical care, and really try to look also in addition to other aspects at what can be done or should be done in the areas of health equity, for example, here in the environment. A very important source for us to look at is literature reviews, which delineate what are the main issues, what does the literature tell us in our field to this point, what are the key messages as pointed for policymakers for action that uh, we could think about how to incorporate in our own work, what are some of the aspects for healthcare quality, and what are the main theoretical frameworks that we should be thinking on basing our research when we try to really um, address the broader, more complex issues that have to do with health equity. And if you look locally, the evidence base for health equity research in Armenia is very um, wide and comprehensive. And, sorry, and if you see uh, a very random list of uh, publications, uh, just a few uh, with authors, some are uh, present in this room, uh, dealing with uh, various issues from perceived barrier tobacco dependency, socioeconomic economic factors and mortality in emergency general surgery, to uh, factors such as uh, uh, undernutrition among children and determinants of multimorbidity following the earthquake. So any topic, any area has at least the potential to be addressed in terms of where are the gaps in populations and the social determinants of health that have to do with the phenomena that we're looking at. So why publish? Um, I think for this audience it's quite evident, but I want to start by asking why not publish? And there are many obstacles and challenges to publishing. One of them is depicted by this cartoon. Maybe some of the students relate to it. But many times people working in operational research don't have time. Their time is allocated to performing the project, to um, actually running the, the um, management and administrative sites of uh, very complex uh, endeavors. And there's not necessarily time allocated for doing the research. Funding is related to that, so many aspects of research require funding, like improving the quality of the data or doing the literature uh, review and finding the evidence and spending time on writing. It all takes resources. And we're often discouraged by rejection, so publishing is not always easy. We try the first journal, get rejected, the second journal, the third journal, and sometimes we just give up. So I want to tell you something, especially for those just earlier in their career, uh, something I tell my students, and I tell them <clears throat> for their first publication, I hope it won't be published in the first journal you're aiming at. They're like, that's mean, <laughs> why do you say that? And I'm only um, being cynical, of course, but I want them to know that this is not the reality of publishing. Publishing often takes a few times, sometimes, from my papers, I see that aiming for the first journal and getting good reviews was really beneficial for helping me to really tailor the message and go into the next uh, journal and being more successful. So, um, but I'm really not doing my job if I'm telling you not to publish, right? <laughs> That's not the reason I'm here. Um, sometimes we publish because of academic requirements. Institutions like as this one exist in order to publish and do research and uh, get the word out in terms of the scientific knowledge. Most importantly, we publish because we want to expand knowledge. If we 
leave only um, the results, the outputs, the products of the projects we're involved as posters, as school papers, as presentations in small meetings, we're not, re not doing our jobs because we're doing a work in order to be able to change and change requires getting to the larger audience and potentially being able to affect policy and practice. Now I will be lying if I'll say that policy and practice are a, only driven by research. They're not. <laughs> They're oftentimes uh, are affected by many other things besides evidence. However, if we have the evidence, it is very important for us to communicate also using publications in order to get the messages we want and to be able to more effectively uh, affect our uh, stakeholders. And I want to even say further that not publishing is maybe even somewhat unethical because we've taken the trouble to ask people to participate and ask people to complete surveys and we've uh, managed to get some time allocated to run our project. So we have an ethical um, responsibility to also try to further this knowledge, expand it and make even a bigger change. And as uh, maybe was also echoed in Carpet's presentation, we have a lot of the work is already there. Maybe it's not so hard to publish as we think. Sometimes it's very far away from us. But if you think about it, you went to the trouble to write a grant proposal or a protocol. So you have the literature review and the methods. And then you wrote your results, you analyzed and you have your results presented. So now all you need to do is put it in the format that is in the format of a journal. And as also was pointed out by the excellent presentation by Carpet, it's a team effort. So if you think about your co-authors, everyone is responsible for a different part, it makes it a bit more um, feasible to publish and to uh, increase this number from a zero publication to potentially 28 or 60 by the number of participants in the project. So after I've convinced you that health equity is important, right, Not that you needed convincing, and that publishing is important, uh, where do I start? So, how to go about it? It's not uh, always easy even for seasoned researchers to uh, go really through the entire process and live through until their paper is out. So, one uh, common belief is that you choose your journal once you finish writing. And I want to really discourage you from doing that. The paper should really at least be uh, um, considered where to publish once you start writing the paper. Because it's not only the format, the number of words and the number of tables, it's really the audience. And you want to tailor your, your message, the literature you're using, and really think about where you're going to publish, if it's a clinical journal or a policy journal if it's international journal or a local journal. It has to do with the way you write the paper, the way you use the evidence, the um, other papers and journals that you cite in order to show relevancy of your work to the journal you're applying to. And even ideally, at least start a little bit of a, a work in thinking about where to publish once you start your research. Because, as I said, the audience is important and sometimes it has to do with your design. So you want to take into consideration issues related to publication, like was mentioned here, the quality of the data, the design of the study, uh, in terms of where you're aiming at at the end, where you want to publish and already think about these issues once you're designing your research and uh, thinking about uh, the context, for example, if it's international, what type of tools do you want to use? What type of considerations should you make if you want to make it more generalizable to an international context? So to find a good home for your paper, some major considerations, as I mentioned, is the audience, the ranking of the journal, I'm not going to talk about it too much. Some say there's a religion of the impact factor. 
The journals are ra ranked according to various metrics, and there's a lot of debate how to measure and where this is scientifically uh, correct the way we're measuring and ranking. But in your area of expertise, you generally know which are the high-end journals, which journals you might want to first aim at when you're thinking about where your paper should go. Time to publication is one other issue. You should generally look how much time does it take for uh, papers in the journal you're aiming for to be published. And for example, I have a paper now in a journal, uh, economic journal. I won't say the name of the journal. The paper is in review for almost a year now. Now after a year, if it gets accepted or revised and some more time goes by, I'm not sure the data is relevant. I'm not sure I even remember what the paper is about. So this is something to consider uh, in terms of the area you want to publish and what you know about the journals. Article types. So each journal has specified uh, the types of articles, whether it's uh, review, commentaries, study protocols, of course, research articles. But you should really also try to see what types of papers does this journal take? So for example, if you have a qualitative paper, but the journal you're aiming for has never published qualitative work, it probably means that this is not a good home for your paper. Sometimes you have very innovative methodology, so it's new for everybody. But sometimes you know that some journals, for example, don't really publish um, certain methodologies like structural equation modeling or path analysis. So this is something to consider. Look at what other papers are published. Article length is also an issue. If you have, uh, again, for example, qualitative or mixed method, and it's quite lengthy, can be 5,000 words, then you don't want a journal that limits to 27 or 2,700 or 3,000 words. The same for figures and tables, looking at what are the requirements of the journal. Special collections are something to really uh, look for because journals often have call for papers. And if there is a call for paper in your area, this is something that uh, should, um, you should look for and aim to try to publish because special collections bring together various perspectives in the area you're researching. They usually are accompanied by a commentary and an editorial, so it also increases the visibility of your work. And when people generally look for papers in the area, they have a better chance to come across a special collection because there's a bunch of papers in the field and therefore your paper also gains from visibility. So I will talk a little bit about, more about special collections soon. And finally about open access and fees. So some of you might be aware that there is abundance of predatory journals open access journals that are not legitimate peer-reviewed journals. And sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between what is uh, legitimate, well-known, well, -known, well uh, accepted within the research community, and what is just a, a journal that is uh, put together often times just for um, economic financial reasons, just to make money, basically. Um, my tip for my students, again, is that if they receive uh, um, email with their name, very polite, sometimes referring to their paper, their first or uh, second paper that they wrote, uh, asking them, inviting them to submit, I usually tell them to say no. Because uh, journals that are prestigious journals that are legitimate will approach uh, mostly senior, more seasoned researchers and they will know that this is something that they were invited for a commentary or for a contribution. And this type of bogus journals for at least uh, get some advice from your advisor, from colleagues in order to be able to distinguish if this is really something you should kind of waste, I would say, uh, your work because you are risking not publishing in a scientifically legitimate journal. So just a word of warning and being aware of these issues. So where to publish equity research? Many places, uh, many uh, journals. 
general journals that have to do with health policy and public health and health services research. These are just few random examples. There are many prestigious journals, The Lancet, BMJ, New England Journal of Medicine, many, many examples you should aim for. But there are also specific journals to the field of health equity, for example, ethnicity and health, and of course, my journal, the reason I'm here, I guess, uh, the International Journal for Equity and Health. So, coming to um, the journal of International, International Journal for Equity and Health, a few words about this journal. Uh, the aims and scope of the journal is to publish, publish research which improves the understanding of issues that influence the distribution of health and healthcare within populations, particularly with regard to identifying and understanding the systematic differences or the lived experience of one or more aspects of health in population groups defined demographically, geographically, or socially. And behind the lines, our journal publishes any health equity-related paper whether it's um, qualitative methodology, sometimes case studies, policy-related research, econometric and various health services-related studies. As long as it has something new to say about health equity. So something new can be a unique phenomena or finding in your population. Something new, of course, is adding to existing literature in a way that significantly improves the knowledge. So just to give you an example, what will be a paper that we probably not accept to our journal at this time, uh, more evidence about the pro-rich inequities in health service use. So there are thousands of papers showing in various countries, in various healthcare systems, that generally more affluent people receive more access to various types of specialist services, especially. So this is something that is already well known and well established. But other aspects that show the unique um, manifestation in their population, in uh, programs that are examined and reported in many, many uh, different aspects, as you will be able to browse yourself in the journal and see, are definitely most welcome. The journal was founded in 2002 by the late Professor Barbara Starfield. Professor Starfield is considered one of, or the expert, the leading world expert in primary care, really setting out not only how, how uh, primary care improves the health care of populations, but also how it helps reduce disparities and inequity in health. And uh, together with Professor Leo Shi from the Johns Hopkins University and our wonderful editorial team, we are very uh, privileged to be able to continue the legacy of Professor Starfield and have it uh, lived through the journal. So coming to um, special collections, as I promised, these are uh, issues you should uh, aim for, the type of publications, if they are relevant to your field, this is something I highly recommend. In our journal, we have ongoing special collections. So what we do is within a topic that a guest editor, one of our associate editor, chooses to publish a special collection, we put out a call for papers, we publish the special collection with 8, 10, 12 publications, and then we continue having the special collection open. So for example, if one of you or your colleagues would like to contribute to this collection, they can indicate in their submission that they would like their paper to be considered for this collection. And in our website under the special collection page, it will also appear. So this will also contribute to the visibility of your paper as I mentioned before. The other ongoing special collections that we have is the showcasing social science approaches to health systems and policy research and practicing governance towards equity in health systems, low and middle income country perspectives and experience, which is a collection we're very proud of and have gotten a lot of uh, um, 
papers and citations and um, kind of visibility. So some more reasons to publish with us, and, and I, I don't get money for this, so <laughs> not advertising my journal for any profit. Uh, but the journal um, is dear to us and important as I presented, so I would like to encourage you to submit. Uh, we are uh, also affiliated with the World Organization of Family Physicians, a special uh, interest group on health equity. And uh, we are very proud to be back higher on the ranking in the first quartile of uh, journals in our category. And with a very um, broad and prestigious representation of countries and uh, contributing organizations. And I welcome you to try to put Armenia and uh, American University of Armenia up on our list. So this is something to aim for maybe next time I come. So coming close to conclusion, a few tips. This is relevant for any journal, for any publication. As I mentioned, look at the aims and scope, look at the fees and funding, and for our journal, there are waivers for authors from low and middle income countries. So there are no publication fees for authors coming from Armenia. Uh, look for language and editing services that are oftentimes available for some charge, but this is something to consider. And for any journal, look and understand what are the copyright uh, rights. So for our uh, um, journal, for any open access journal, the authors hold their copyright. But for other uh, more traditional journals, the journals themselves um, hold the copyright. And I want to say something um, for open access, just uh, um, why consider open access and why open access is really in a sense, equitable, because all readers have access to the publications. And when we think about our mission to expand knowledge, this is really a great way to have your findings available to audience around the world. While in traditional uh, publications, although a lot of journals are also uh, now uh, offering open access uh, uh, options, in traditional publications, only people who have, for example, from their organization or can pay the fees can have access to the knowledge. So this is something that we uh, are fortunate to have this growth in open access in terms of the visibility of our research. Um, as I mentioned, look at the types of uh, uh, papers, study protocols. I, really want to encourage you, if you're doing a study, you're doing a program, you have a protocol. So there are many venues to publish study protocols. This is also very useful. After a few years, when you come to publishing your results, sometimes the field has changed, sometimes there's competition in the field. But if you were the first to develop a protocol, to develop a program, and you published it, your name is already there you are the one that has the PI uh, for this, uh, the IP, sorry, for this, for, your, for being the PI. And lastly, after you publish successfully, I urge you to promote your uh, research in social media, in various venues, in order to expand the knowledge, gain more visibility, and really have your message reach to where it should be reached. To conclude, this is my last slide, two slides. Um, I could really give a whole talk or seminar course about where health equity is going to, what is the future of health equity. But I really want to leave you with just one thought about the role of health information technology. And I think this is a game changer in our field because health information technology has the potential to bring health care to people who don't have any access or have barriers to access to health care. And if you think about many people who don't have access to health care, have a smartphone. And through this technology, we can collect data, we can ensure the quality of the data, we can reach populations in their own language, in their own setting. And there's a lot of potential to think about how to incorporate various health information technology tools to improve equity. So with this I conclude.
Thank you. Toda. Merci. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Efrat, for your presentation. My name is Rosanna, and my question is the following. How is it possible to make sure that it's not the titles, degrees, and affiliations of the authors that condition the decision of editors or reviewers for accepting the publication, but it's truly the quality of the content and quality of the paper? So in other words, how is it possible to achieve equity in publishing? Thank you. Get the toughest question. This is a real challenge. Coming from Israel, uh, we are dealing with similar issues because we are a small country and oftentimes we need to make the case why is something we publish in Israel has relevancy to the international uh, audience. And uh, these issues of who are the authors and uh, sometimes a sense of uh, politics within publication is, is real. It's not something I... Know, disregarding. So first I want to tell you at our journal, uh, there's definitely, and you can look at the publication, the types of authors, uh, on the contrary, we welcome from various countries, authors, first time authors, uh, we put an emphasis on really having the journal as a platform for people published from everywhere and from any background, as long as it's rigorous research. Um, there are various approaches to dealing with this potential bias in publication. One is sometimes journals um, allow to um, indicate who you don't want reviewers for your papers. So this is a tool, if you think there are politics within your field, even someone who's highly prestigious in the field, you think that you might not want them to specifically review because of uh, fear of competition then this is a tool that can be used to indicate who you don't want as readers. Um, I've encountered um, various ways to try to form collaborations within well-known experts. And although this is sometimes regarded as you know, not the best side of research and politics involved, I think, depending of course on the researcher, this also has an opportunity to really strengthen your work. Because when, in research that I've uh, um, been involved, or my colleagues been involved, sometimes bringing on an international expert really helped to drive the message through. And this is something, you know, we should be humble as researchers, as the cartoon says, we don't know everything. And we have uh, the opportunity also, if possible, to collaborate, and this can strengthen our work. Um, and I want to encourage you not to get discouraged because of the many venues. So if in a specific field you encounter some type of opposition or maybe you feel it's unfair that you can't really publish, think about how you may be able to tailor your message to either a broader audience or some other type of, a, of a journal in order to gain the visibility you want. Uh, so for, for example, if you're looking at a specific program and looking in a specific clinical field, maybe your work also has uh, implications for a broader public health journal, which might not be so you know, in, in the niche and in this politics of a specific group. So these are general advice. I hope they'll be helpful. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The presenter is um, Dr. Salvatore Rubino, and uh, Dr. Rubino is a professor of microbiology at the medical faculty at the University of Sassari in Italy. Um, he is here in his uh, position as a chief editor of the Journal of Infectious, uh, Infectious Diseases um, in Developing Countries. Uh, however, obviously, he has a day job as well, and, and uh, part of it is uh, to teach uh, in, in doctoral programs in the university, as well as doing research and, and other service, including 
being on various committees and, and WHO expert panels on, um, for example, laboratory activities in developing countries. So he will introduce um, his view on the, on the journal and publishing. Thank you for the presentation, and it's an honor and privilege to me to be here. Uh, it's uh, the first time that I am in Armenia, and I had a new country in my scores. Now I am almost 75 countries that I have visited. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay, good. And, um, uh, okay. As uh, I am the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Infection in Developing Country, uh, I mean, we started with the journal with the idea to reduce the gap uh, between rich country and developing country as concern uh, publication. But I want to start uh, my presentation uh, talking about uh, the dark side of a publication. Uh, the dark side, unfortunately, is uh, the rejection of the paper. And uh, this happened almost in, uh, let's say, 80% of the cases. So you see it's a, a, huge, a, it's a huge number. And uh, the reason, the major reason for rejection is the quality, of course, science is uh, fluid, novelty, and uh, sometime, uh, and this is one of the main uh, reasons because we, we decide to have a journal uh, for developing country, is uh, that uh, many journals reject uh, the paper just because the data regard uh, just the local, so just Armenia, for instance, and especially the American Journal, they like uh, to, to, have, um, to publish a paper with a broad topics. And for us, uh, in some way, is a, is a, is a, is a mistake. Because uh, if we, we consider the case of uh, SARS, SARS uh, was a local problem in uh, Guangdong, uh, that is a region of uh, of uh, China, and uh, in the time that uh, SARS appeared in uh, the Toronto Star Ju magazine, that is a major magazine of Toronto, they just wrote in the last page of the journal that there were a local problem in just in far away in China. And as you know, SARS reached uh, uh, Canada and was one of the I think uh, most uh, tragedy in some way uh, from also from also health and economical point of view. And uh, okay, so this uh, the so I want to just uh, especially for the student that you are not a student, but in this way you are student now. The top uh, the top reason to reject paper, uh, as I I say. Uh, we have a poor uh, experimental uh, design and or inadequate uh, investigation. Uh, sometimes the problem is a small number for this of a sample of a case. So this can be a problem. The other problem is to find uh, the right journal because you can submit a paper that is not in there to the aim of the journal. And then, uh, unfortunately for us, that uh, we, we speak Italian or, or Armenia or whatever, and we don't speak English, that is a, a big uh, problem because, uh, especially English or uh, American journal, they don't like. And uh, we had an interesting case. I mean, if you do just, I should speak yeah. Yeah, I know, but, but oh, no, uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. because I need to speak. Uh, yeah, you can just turn it on. Yeah. 
For instance, uh, sometimes they just look at the names and then, uh, they, and then they reject the paper, saying the English. And, uh, and uh, we have a case in which we publish, uh, we had a paper with several names from several countries, and the paper was uh, revised by our technical editor for English. And even in that case, they wrote, OK, we cannot accept the paper. The English, the English was not good. <laughs> and um, OK. Uh, also, sometimes it's not clear the aim of the study. That is another, another important point. Uh, the methods sometimes are not uh, well described, uh, as well as uh, all the design of the paper. Of course, uh, when we do some research, uh, we thought that our data are the most important in the world. And, uh, but this is not true for all. So we did uh, sometimes an uh, overinterpretation of our result. And this can be a limit. Another problem is statistics. For instance, I am a very bad uh, statistician, and but statistics, uh, as you know, is very important. Then one of the other um, major points are uh, how you present the paper, especially as uh, concerned the figure and, uh, and table. Because sometimes the table and figure should help you to explain better uh, what you cannot uh, write. But sometimes uh, the table are more confusing and as well as the figure. So you should uh, take care about uh, this aspect. Uh, then sometimes conclusion and supported data are weak. And uh, also what is very important when you start to write a paper, you should uh, read uh, almost all is already written about uh, your, this to the topic that uh, you like to develop. And uh, I find a lot of paper with, uh, that they use a very old uh, reference. So it's very important to add the new reference. Of course, a lack of novelty or originality is, uh, is uh, quite important and also um, Sometimes there is a problem of uh, the ethical issue. Uh, you cannot publish a paper about uh, prisoners, HIV incidents in prisoners in, in Italy without really having ethical uh, approval and also <coughs> the consent of the people that are involved in the project, even if uh, they are in prison. And, um, Okay, so that are the major point. Another big problem is, uh, is uh, plagiarism. Oh. And, um, you know, there are several aspects of uh, plagiarism. I, uh, my, uh, my group, last year uh, I had a, a master's student from Vietnam. She was working on a candidate. So I tell her, uh, check. Uh, for in the literature, and she find uh, a paper on uh, the presence of a candida inside uh, a cantamoeba. And then in another paper on uh, candida inside the jardia. So she brought me the paper. They were exactly the same paper. The difference was the name of authors, <laughs> And they just changed the name Akantamiba with uh, Jardia. But it was uh, exactly the same paper. And they were both, uh, one of course was original, the second was uh, published in a very important uh, journal. So we wrote, of course, today. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, 
I know that um, when you are young, you want to say something, and you're reading a, a well-written uh, paper from uh, important scientists from the, from the state that speak really well English. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nice to copy one part, because you won't say the same. But of course, uh, this is uh, plagiarism. And uh, I will suggest you to go to this paper of uh, Peter Mason that uh, we published some years ago in uh, JDC, in which uh, he really explained you what this means. Okay, uh, in this day I am, uh, let's say, and here in Armenia, part uh, in, for for uh, participating to this interesting meeting, but after I hope to have uh, some day of vacation. So I will, I will not uh, open my computer, but when I will be back, uh, my, and I will open the page of uh, JDC, there is a list of articles that are waiting for me. And uh, JDC is becoming a very popular journal in developing country, but not only. Now China discovered JDC. And, and we are in a, in a moment in which we are dying for the two success. So, because we received too, too many papers a day. Uh, so coming back to the dark side, the rejection is a, ever become a measure of a good journal. Uh, maybe it's true, maybe not. I, I will just open this to a discussion. But of course, if you are rejected, I mean, don't feel too bad. You know that, the, as I say, a large number, 70 to 9 percent, and, uh, and uh, so you should not ask you, I mean, you know it's bad for your, your, uh, your inside uh, ego, but uh, have a drink, uh, uh, run, <laughs> or sing, I don't know. But uh, you have the opportunity to, to improve the paper and to, to, to submit again. But what is important, be a little self-critical, because you should really understand uh, what are the problems. And you can solve. I hope so. Um, so that is the reason, because it's important to understand why the paper was uh, rejected. So I, I briefly, I will uh, come back uh, to the Journal of Infection in Developing Countries. As I told you, almost now we are almost 10 years, uh, with a group of friends uh, working in developing countries, one day we were in a bar in Sassari. There were a friend from Zimbabwe, a friend from England, uh, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> We just uh, submitted a very good paper to an American uh, ISM uh, journal, and it uh, was a very good paper about uh, salmonella and antibiotic resistance, and they, the paper was rejected. They say, this is a wonderful paper, but has a local interest. Then at that point, uh, we decided to found uh, the Journal of Infection, in which the the local problems are our problem. And in fact, when you see the guidelines how to write a, a good paper, always they, they say, never uh, mention where you did the paper in the title. Okay? Because that is bad for, uh, let's say, a broad so, you can say the discovery of a new bacteria, let's say, but not the right in Armenia or in Ukraine. Just say uh, the, the discovery of salmonella, blah, 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 okay? <laughs> but for us, uh, if you read uh, our uh, published paper, 90%, there is a place where the paper was done. And that is uh, our 
uh, principal uh, aim of the journal. And uh, yeah, you can even see in this, uh, in this uh, front page of, uh, of the journal, of our journal. But uh, the most important thing for us is our mentoring system. So when you submit a paper, it's not just uh, a number, like it is, <coughs> of course you need a number, but you are not a number, you are a scientist, and uh, then we, we, we enter in contact with you from the first stage. When you just submit the paper, we have people that already talk with you how you submit, if there are some problem, and then in all those stages uh, of till bringing it to the publication. That, of course, is a peer review, and we want that you publish at international level. But we will do everything to try to help you to publish at international level. Uh, we have also several uh, regional offices uh, in order to be in contact with the people and uh, we create uh, this uh, uh, regional office involving people, uh, institution, hospital and uh, also for financial support. Of course. We don't have a publisher, so we are a homemade journal. We have a, a free platform that we took from students that created this platform in Canada just for, the, uh, for uh, publishing a journal at the university. Of course, we had some problem. Just to buy a platform when we start uh, our project, they ask us uh, 300,000 euros just to have the platform. So in this way, we had this free platform. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, we, we, basic, we, we have a lot of volunteer people around the work that help us in the mentoring system. And, uh, of course, a major problem is uh, the English language. And uh, we like also to have uh, cooperate with people with other culture. Again, uh, if you are from Syria, not in this day that, uh, you know, Syria situation is uh, very bad, but when we start uh, the project, and you, you send a paper to an uh, American journal, they just refuse because you are Syrian, because of the international. And uh, so for us, it's important to put together also different cultural, and of course, uh, uh, expertise. And uh, so the, the local um, regional office, uh, of course, uh, uh, promote the journal. Uh, we try also to, to do, we try a project to make a translation from English to the local language. But of course, it was a lot of work and after one year, it was impossible to continue to do, to that, to that, to do that. And um, we are, uh, very interested, not only, of course, to be in contact with scientists, I mean, a journal, but also with students, and also with people, the medical doctor, or even nurse that work at the hospital, not only academic. Uh, of course, we organize a lot of meetings like, like this, and I am, thanks a lot to Carapet for this opportunity. And uh, we are increasing uh, the re regional office that, of course, are, uh, con uh, they are um, uh, coordinated by our central office that is in Italy. And uh, we have in Spain, in China, in, in Turkey, and in other countries. So, illusion and passion for working together, uh, together in filling the gap between uh, developing and developed country in biomedical science, and uh, we believe the JDC is a very bad journal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? 
Okay. We can discuss uh, like maybe. Uh, but feel free to approach. Um, again, let's thank our last speaker. So the next uh, on the program, I'll do it from here, is that uh, we're going to break uh, for um, buffet lunch. During the lunch, uh, there are uh, posters that you've seen, and they were referred to as, uh, by, by speakers already. Uh, they come from uh, previous uh, sorted trainings in, in Ukraine or in Armenia, or uh, those who are uh, being trained here at the AUA in, in the Masters of Public Health program. You have until uh, about uh, 2.20 uh, to review them, or actually do it a bit earlier, uh, do it by 2.10 uh, while you're eating. Uh, go around and put uh, the most preferred uh, posters number, they're all numbered, uh, put them in a box that um, uh, colleagues here will show you. So um, take some food, and walk around, read the posters, uh, pick the one that got the most of your attention or uh, you like the most and put that number on a sticker and put it in a box that you will find out there. Uh, we will then come back here at about 2.20 to 25 uh, to um, um, give an award to the best poster and to conclude uh, today's symposium. Uh, take advantage of the time. If you have any specific questions, you are shy or, or English is not your first language, uh, please um, make sure to approach the speakers with any questions. We're all more than welcome to interact. So with that, we will come back here at 2.20. Thank you. And I want to thank Karapet, Rosanna, and Nazeli for organizing all the logistical aspects of this event. Thank you. the vote for the best poster. Um, uh, we have a little uh, gift for that, that group. I'll save some of the jokes for later. 
but the best poster voted by those in, in the room or those who have voted uh, is when will the coughing stop? Uh, uh, the characteristics of children's whooping cough in Armenia by Sose Markalian, um, Marcus Wells, Rixim uh, May, Aprician, Tatevi Grigorian, Christina Akopian, Olga Denisiuk, uh, Roni Zakaria, and Karapet Dachtian. So if you could please come here. <laughs> And if those whose names I've read, you want to just show your face. Stand up to be recognized. Uh, oh yeah. So we have a little, uh, I think it's a predictable gift, a book. And, and I'm sure uh, between the team members, you can divide the pages who wants which part. <laughs> And, and enjoy, and obviously this is just a token from the organizers. Thank you. Okay. Good night, Matthew. Uh -huh. um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all uh, uh, co-authors uh, who helped me very, very much. Uh, this was my first uh, publication in the uh, international journal. Uh, thank you, Karapet, uh, to make this possible in Armenia. Uh, thank you, Tatevik, uh, the uh, uh, second co-author. Thank you, Olga Denius. And uh, thank you very much to Roni and uh, to Christine Akopian, our, uh, uh, who is also from co-authors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to say something about the book that you just received because the organizers spent some time deciding what book to choose as the award for the best poster presentation. And uh, these are two epidemiologists from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And if you notice, the cover is Dr. Harutun Armenian's painting who is a professor emeritus from Johns Hopkins University, our founding dean, who is also the president emeritus of AUA. So enjoy, it's a methods book. We hope that you can learn and become a stronger researcher.